What's up everyone, Dubblade here with a Hunter's Guide to the Safi Jiva Siege, also known as the Red Dragon Siege, which is also known as the Mature Xeno Jiva Siege. In this guide, I will go over everything you need to know, including hunter requirements, monster mechanics, rewards, and more. Now the first aspect players should be aware of is that they need to complete a few tasks before they can access the Red Dragon Siege. First of all, they have to have reached Master Rank 24 or higher and have access to the Guiding Lands. Next, players need to have completed a few special assignments which are given to the Hunter by NPCs with purple exclamation marks above their head. These assignments include the Sterling Pride and Reveal Thyself Destroyer, which involves Rajang and unlocking the volcanic region of the Guiding Lands. Players will then need to take on the special assignments Across the Lost Path and the Point of No Return, which involves Stygian Zenoga, the unlocking of the Tundra region in the Guiding Lands, and the recon mission where hunters will first get a glimpse of Xenojiva's adult form. Once these assignments are complete and hunters have talked to the relevant NPCs, Hunters will then be able to take on the Red Dragon Siege from the Gathering Hub. Now the main goal of the Siege is to slay Safi Jiva in the secluded valley through the combined efforts of all Hunters within the Gathering Hub. Anyone who is familiar with the Korv Taroth Siege will have an idea of what to expect here. It is designed for multiplayer and attempting it solo can be a strain on a Hunter. Not impossible, but it's a stressful feat if you decide to take on the Red Dragon solo. So when you and your fellow Hunters are ready, your entire Gavrin hub will combine forces to slay the Elder Dragon. Each hunting party will be divided up into groups of four and depart on the hunt as normal. During the hunt, players will need to drive Safi Jiva from area to area as the siege progresses. This is done by dealing as much damage as you can to the monster, breaking monster body parts and using the environment to deal large amounts of burst damage to the Elder Dragon. Doing this will cause Safi Jiva to call upon its ability to drain energy from the environment and heal itself. So ultimately this means that Safi Jiva cannot stay in an area for long as eventually it will exhaust the energy supply of that area and then have to move on to find a new source of energy. So it's a game of cornering the monster and getting it to the point where it can no longer drain energy from the land and ultimately giving hunters a chance to slay the Elder Dragon. Now every time a body part is broken, energy is drained from an area or other research task is complete, whether it be by the player's hunting party or an allied hunting party, players will be notified and given points towards the overall siege's progress. The more points, the more the siege will advance. This can be tracked before departing on the siege by talking to the pub lass in the gathering hub under the Safi Jiva Siege submenu. Ultimately, the more tasks you complete during the siege, the more rewards you will receive at the conclusion of the hunt too. But this is all easier said than done. It may take hunters multiple attempts at cornering and slaying Safi Jiva as the hunt is just 20 minutes long. But so long as you have multiple groups running the siege in your gathering hub, it shouldn't take more than one or two trips to the secluded valley and complete the siege, with consecutive trips to the secluded valley becoming easier and easier. Now a few miscellaneous bits of information that fits into the overview section of this guide. Firstly, if you change gathering hubs via changing lobbies, you will lose any siege progress upon joining a new lobby's gathering hub. Also, the siege ends when one of your gathering hub's hunting parties slay Safi Jeeva. Now it doesn't end the siege straight away, say for example you're on a hunt and an allied hunting party slays Safi Jeeva, a message will pop up on your screen notifying you that the Elder Dragon has been slain, but you and your team are free to continue the hunt you're on and reap the rewards for your own kill. But should you fail your hunt, whether it be through deaths or time limits, the siege will still be counted as complete when you return to the gathering hub. You'll still get rewards, but these will be reduced rewards unfortunately. Now when it comes to fighting Safi Jeeva, she is more than just a carbon copy of Xeno Jeeva. Whilst yes, she does share a few moves with her infant form, she has more to offer when it comes to her repertoire of attacks. In this section we will go over the mechanics of the fight including Safi Jeeva's notable attacks, environmental hazards, zone information and more. Now the easiest way to cover the siege in terms of mechanics is to cover each of the three areas hunters will face Safi Jeeva. The first area Hunters will have time to get used to Safi Jeeva's basic attacks and moves. She'll attack hunters with swipes from her front claws, various tail swipes and slams, stomps with her hind legs and bite attacks. She could also call upon her stores of energy to perform various breath attacks, to which she uses sparingly in this area unless a player gets too far away from her. Her most deadly attacks in this area involve her plunging her tail or 
other limbs into the ground to cause eruptions of energy, knocking players flying into the air while causing significant damage to them at the same time. The other notable strong hitting attack she has in this area is her delayed breath attack, which is a move where Sappy Jeeva charges up her breath for a short moment, but delays in firing it. Instead, she'll track where a player is going before unleashing it. This can be tough to avoid at first, but with a Superman dive or breaking her line of sight, players can avoid being hit by this move. But the moves she uses in this area are clearly telegraphed, easy to read, and ultimately avoid. But what tools can hunters use against Safi Jeeva? Well first is the Clutch Claw. Safi Jeeva's body parts can be tenderized in just one Clutch Claw attack, regardless of what weapon you are using. So make sure you're using your Clutch Claw before you begin your assault. Also in this zone there are two hanging rocks in the north, east and northwest corners. These falling rocks can be shot down on top of Safi Jeeva to cause a good chunk of damage and knock her over. So just make sure she's under them when you shoot them down. There are also environmental traps around the outer edges of the zone, namely towards the southern area. This area has vines that a hunter can use to trap Safi Jeeva, preventing it from moving or fighting back. However, to trigger this trap, Safi Jeeva needs to be near the vines and then hunters have to cause the Elder Dragon to flinch, either by damage or breaking a monster body part, which will cause it to trip slightly and become entangled in the vines. Anyway, after battling in the zone for long enough, Safi Jeeva will take enough damage to cause her to suck the zone dry of energy, resulting in her moving on to zone 2, located further down the secluded valley. In zone 2, players will face most of what they experienced already in zone 1, with a few new additions, namely Safi Jeeva's Ayah and the Sapphire of the Emperor. First of all though, let's go over Safi Jeeva's Ayah. This is an aggro mechanic the monster uses, which results in the monster turning all its attention to a single hunter. Other hunters can be still hit by attacks, but the brunt of the monster's attacks will be against the person with Safi Jeeva's ire. You can tell who has the ire via a message on screen and Safi Jeeva's eyes turning red, which will cause a red line to appear between her and the targeted hunter. But how does a player get the ire? Well, there are two ways. First of all, the ire will be drawn to the person who is causing the most amount of damage to the other dragon. This unfortunately is normally against a player who is DPS focused. The second way is to use the Clutch Claw's flinch shot after someone else has got the ire. Doing this will turn the attention and draw the ire to the hunter who performs the flinch shot. But why would you want to control Safi Jeeva's ire? Well, there are multiple reasons. First is that the longer the ire is active, the more energy Safi Jeeva will use up. This means that she draws more and more energy from the land, resulting in an ultimately quicker siege. The other reason is that hunters who do not maintain the Aya, and ultimately the Aya phase runs out, then Safi Jeeva will enrage, becoming a lot more deadly with liberal use of AoE attacks and more, causing widespread damage to your hunting party. So keeping Safi Jeeva's Aya for as long as possible is recommended. But how do you keep the Aya? Well, it's a simple case of attacking the monster while you have Safi Jeeva's Aya. Do enough damage and the ire will be maintained for longer. So ultimately a hunting party needs some form of tank for this fight. A person fulfilling a tank role, especially if they have a shield, can keep Safi Jeeva in place for long periods of time, resulting in maximum damage as your other teammates won't have to worry about being hit too much, taking damage or chasing the monster around the arena. Now one aspect about Safi Jeeva's ire that you should be aware of, especially if you are tanking the monster, is that should you get too far away from the monster, then it starts making use of more powerful attacks, namely a command grab that will deal a ton of damage. Alternatively, if you have the Safi Jeeva ire and you're too close to the monster, it makes use of more AoE based attacks which can result in your hunting party taking damage. Now any weapon can tank to a certain extent. The most effective though are weapons with shields. The Lance, Heavy Bowgun and Gun Lance are my personal top picks for this role, but a Charge Blade, Sword and Shield and even Greatsword can take up this mantle of block tanking. Just be sure you're still attacking the monster in between her attacks to keep the ire going for as long as possible and to remember to use the Guard Up skill. This is very important as you need this to be able to block every single one of her attacks. But if you don't have a shield user in your party, you can still have people fulfilling the tank role. Evade tanks work well, such as bow or light bowgun users, able to keep the ire up quite easily while dodging incoming attacks. It's a little bit more tricky, but doable. You can also make use of counter tanks, such as longsword users who can counter through their EI slashes and foresight slashes every attack that's incoming, but to do this you really have to channel your inner samurai. 
but if it's a case that you have no weapon that is able to tank, having a player take a temporal mantle or evade mantle to the hunt can help when it comes to Safi Jeeva's ire. So if you go into the hunt expecting to tank Safi Jeeva, just be ready to flinch shot the Elder Dragon to get the ire onto you, as more than likely you will not have enough DPS to get the ire straight away. So the other new aspect Safi Jeeva brings to the fight, starting in Area 2, is her ultimate move, the Sapphire of the Emperor. A slow cast in AoE that will one-shot any hunter caught by it. And this strong one-hitting move can only be avoided in one way. Use the environment. Starting in Area 2 you will see crags jutting from the floor. These are how you avoid Safi's ultimate. When you see the monster flying into the air, it indicates two things. Either she's moving zones or it's her ultimate move. So when you see her take off into the sky, sheave your weapon and get ready to run. Whilst in the air and casting her ultimate move, she will spray down blue flames across the ground, covering the whole area. Players will be slowed down slightly when they're moving through the blue flames, but it won't do any damage, and they'll have just a few seconds whilst moving through the blue flames to use the crags to break line of sight with Safi Jeeva, because after a few seconds, the flame spewing will unleash the Sapphire of the Emperor, which is a slow moving star that drops down from Safi Jeeva hits the ground and then detonates in a huge explosion destroying everything in the area by the crags and players who are stood behind them. So always keep an eye on where the crags are when fighting Safi Jeeva. Hunters can also make use of their controller's vibration during this move to tell if they are safe or not. If the controller stops rumbling while you are behind a crag it indicates that you are safe and won't be hit by the move. So continue the fight as you normally would, just taking into account the new iron mechanic as well as the sapphire of the emperor ultimate move till Safi Jeeva uses up all the energy in the area and then moves on to the final zone. In area 3 players will finally have cornered the elder dragon and it's time to go for the kill. Although this area is normally the longest area in terms of time and toughest as Safi Jeeva will be fighting for her life. During this phase of the siege players will have to contend with all of Safi Jeeva's attacks from the previous zones including the iron mechanic and her ultimate ability. On top of that she will be focusing and using the stronger moves more often. During this phase she will also go into a critical state as the energy ebbs and flows within her. This is notable as the hit zones of the monster become weaker overall allowing hunters to deal more damage. You can tell she's in her critical state by a message on screen and hunters will be able to see her body pulse with white energy. Safi Jeeva will also be a lot more dangerous to players in this critical state. The other main change apart from the critical state is that the Sapphire of the Emperor can now destroy the crags that players use to avoid the attack. This means that players won't die from the move should they be standing behind a crag when the ultimate is used, but the crags will slowly disintegrate as the attack ends. This limits the amount of cover hunters will have during the next cast of the Sapphire of the Emperor. But during the fight Safi Jeeva will struggle and she will use her fiery breath in anger sometimes resulting in boulders falling from the sky which can be used as makeshift crags for hunters to use the next time she casts her ultimate ability. Also in area 3, after she's cast her ultimate ability for the first time the zone will open up and gas will start to seep into the environment. These gas pockets can be ignited to cause massive damage to Safi Jeeva. Continue the fight and eventually you will either slay Safi Jeeva or she will retreat and wait for the next rematch. Now of course preparing for a hunt can be half the battle so knowing Safi Jeeva's weaknesses can help for the upcoming siege as it allows you to build or use weapons to counter the Elder Dragon. Safi Jeeva shares similar weaknesses to its infant form with a 2 star weakness rating to every element except for Dragon which has a 3 star rating which indicates that Elder Seal works well against the Elder Dragon. Basically Elder Seal will suck the energy from her depleting her energy supplies which will cause her to suck up the energy from the various zones more quickly. The various ailments are also good options for Safi Jeeva with Poison and Blast being rated as 3 stars, Paralysis and Stun as 2 stars and Sleep being 1 star. So this means you can crowd control the Elder Dragon for some uninterrupted damage output. Speaking of which Safi can also be mounted and brought down quickly so take advantage of this too. Now whilst Safi Jeeva may be quite weak to various elements, Hunter should also be aware that she can also inflict them with certain blights including Fire Blight and Dragon Blight. So when you have finally brought down the Elder Dragon you will want to claim your rewards. 
Now there are three aspects when it comes to rewards. First of all are the monster parts which you get right away after beating Safi Jiva. Remember that if you want a certain body part or certain material that you need to break that body part related to it during the siege. For example if you want a fell wing then you're going to have to break Safi Jiva's wings. The next set of rewards are when you've returned to the Gavrin hub and you talk to the pub lass. Depending how the siege went, you will be first rewarded with various rarity Draco lights, which are upgrade materials. These materials are used on the third and final set of rewards, which are the awakened weapons. Now depending again on how the siege went, you will have access to a variety of awakened or relic weapons. The choice of weapons will be random, but you are guaranteed at least one weapon that matches the weapon you used in the siege. So say you went into it with a bow, then you're guaranteed at least one bow option. So as I said, depending on how the siege went, you'll be able to select a few weapons to take home with you. All the stats on the weapons are the same, depending on of course what weapon you choose. So for example, all the bows will have the same stats, all the greatswords will have the same stats and so on. The only differences are the elements, elements, and the starting awakened ability on the weapon. And I would suggest taking whatever weapon has the element or element you desire, because the starting awakened ability can be changed later. So you have your new fancy relic weapon, it's time to go to the workshop and slap on some awakened abilities. To do this you talk to the smithy and go to the upgrade gear option. Here you will be able to use the draco lights you've earned to upgrade the weapon and with each level you will be given a choice of three awakened abilities to apply to the weapon you've upgraded. Each weapon can have up to five awakened abilities on it so take that into account. Also you don't have to apply the abilities if you don't want to or they don't meet your specific desires. And this can be done by selecting the option store potential at the bottom. Storing potential gives you a better chance of rolling a higher or more rarer ability the next time you level it up. So ultimately this gives you a chance to create your own weapon with the only limitation being what type of element or element you started with. But there are a few aspects you should be aware of. First of all the level of the awakened ability can go up to level 6. Although apparently you can only have one level 6 awakened ability on any one weapon. Also the set bonuses you can have on the weapon like say Nagakuga's Essence does not give you the full set bonus. It only acts as if you had one piece of the set. So you would still need to wear two pieces of the Nagakuga armor in order to get the full true spare shot bonus for example. Also, it should be noted that you can only have one set bonus awakened ability on any one weapon. Also finally, in regards to stored potential, should you take a awakened weapon into the Safi Jiva Siege, the weapon will naturally store up energy, increasing its stored potential level as you progress through the siege. So it's a way of storing potential in a weapon without actually spending Draco Lights. Now the awakened weapons have the potential to be some of the strongest in the game and will allow for even more builds. I wouldn't say they will replace every single existing weapon out there but they will allow for a lot more options. Now when it comes to rewards there may come a point where you have all the weapons you need so you'll be stuck with unwanted weapons. Now you can leave them behind if you want to and not pick up any rewards or alternatively you can take the unwanted weapons to the Elder Melder and convert them into Draco Lights. Now having completed the Safi Jiva Siege enough times, hunters will be able to craft the Safi Jiva armor set. These are strong armor sets that come with a ton of useful skills or jaw sockets. On top of that they have strong elemental resistances and it comes with one of the strongest set bonuses in the game, the Dragon Bane Awakening or True Dragon Bane Awakening. This set bonus activates when you draw your weapon. This will change the appearance of the armor and on top of that it will increase your affinity, elemental damage, ailment damage and build up but as a result you will take damage with each hit that connects with the monster you're hunting. This health though can be recovered once you've hit the monster enough times but it's a real risk and reward armor set. On top of that you can also craft palico armor which is decent enough but more importantly when you enter combat it will cause your palico to sprout wings from the back of the armor so your little furball appears a bit more threatening. But there we have it, that is everything you need to know about the Red Dragon Siege. Now of course there are more tactics out there and tricks that hunters will use in the fight against Safi Jiva so if you have anything to add please leave a comment down below. And until next time I've been Datablade bringing you a hunter's guide to the Red Dragon Siege in Monster Hunter World Iceborne. Hope you enjoyed the video, thanks for watching, subscribe and like for more.